There's more to being a great D&D player than just rolling dice, knowing the rules, and role-playing well. And our seven principles will help put every player in tune with the heart of the game. Greetings, adventurers. My name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the, the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Today we're taking a look at our top seven principles for being an excellent D&D player. Now, these principles are about being an awesome person to play with in the game, in the social situation that you're in with your friends and the Dungeon Master. They're not so much about how to get the most out of the rules, how to be an awesome role player, or how to kick the monster's butts and bring home all the treasure. Yeah, we're looking beyond those aspects of the game and we're focusing on what you need to bring to the table, uh, the things that you need to do to really participate and engage with the game that's being presented to you. It's all about having a great time with you and your friends together at the table. And we find that these principles have helped us in our games manage those social situations really be in tune with each other and make sure that everyone's laughing, having a good time, and really participating in the action of D&D. So, let's get rolling. So, we're gonna start off with what we consider rule zero. So it's not even one of our seven, this is just the fundamental of the game of D&D, and that is having fun. Yeah, having fun isn't a principle, it's not a tip, it's a priority. It's why we play the game in the first place. And sometimes it's really important to keep that in mind whenever you're running into a social problem at the table. Yeah, when you're playing D&D, &D, it's supposed to be you and your friends, or possibly new friends that you're about to make, getting together at a table and enjoying something collectively. Our principles are here to guide us to have fun. Not only so that you can have a good time, but so that you as a player, as a person, are contributing to the fun of everyone else at the table. The whole point of D&D is to have a rewarding and memorable experience that when you leave at the end of it, you want to talk about, you're going to remember, and you're going to remember it as a fond thing that you did, a fond memory with your friends. You want to bring your best self to the table so that you're ready to be engaged and participate positively with everyone else, especially the dungeon master and your friends. As long as everyone leaves laughing and having a good time, You've done a good job with Dungeons and Dragons, whatever shape that takes. And I want to qualify by this by saying these principles are not ironclad rules. They're just our opinion on the matter. And there's a lot of ways to make sure that everyone is protecting the fun of each other at the table. Some tables need more and less rules than this. And it is important to talk with everyone else at the table about what your principles are going to be and set those expectations properly about what's going to protect the fun for everyone at the table. With that in mind, let's talk about what our principles themselves are. We're going to start off with a high level overview of what all the principles are. Bear in mind, of course, that there's many more principles that go into making a good player. This is not an exhaustive list, but these are some of our favorites. And we haven't really ranked them in any order of importance because they all work together. But the very first principle probably is the most important and that's be respectful. And the second one is be focused. The third is be reliable. Fourth, be prepared. The fifth is be cooperative. And the sixth is be constructive. And our final principle is be descriptive. So let's explore what each of these mean in detail. So let's talk about being respectful at our table. This is really Wheaton's law. Don't be a dick. Yeah, we cannot stress that enough. Really, if there's anything that you're doing that's making other people at the table feel bad or feel uncomfortable, then you're probably not supposed to be doing that. Being respectful means treating all the other players with trust and open-mindedness. And as well, trusting and respecting the dungeon master and their authority in that role. Um, if you're second guessing the dungeon master, if you're always questioning their rulings, if you don't like it when they vary from the rules as written, you need to communicate with that with your dungeon master instead of being argumentative or harassing them when they don't do things the exact way that you want them to. I would say being respectful also means not cutting off the other players at the table, letting everybody have a turn in the spotlight, 
and really just sharing that table with every person that's there. You're having a collaborative experience and you should share that around the whole table and be respectful of everybody's time and everybody's need for enjoyment and fun from this game. And make no mistake, it is not acceptable to have fun at the expense of other people, particularly when those other people are your friends sitting around a table with you playing a game. Yeah, you want to make sure that you are being respectful of people's feelings. Uh, you don't want to say or do anything that's going to cause somebody to feel undignified. And if you do, stop it and apologize. It's always okay to talk to the other people that you're playing with about what sorts of things are appropriate and not appropriate at your table. And that should be a discussion that you have with your friends and your dungeon masters. If you're not happy with that, if you feel re reined in or censored, perhaps that's not the right game group for you to be playing with. You need to know these things before you dive into a game group and never assume that just because you find something funny that the other people at the table aren't going to find that um, upsetting or frustrating. If you are being offensive at the table and your argument is that this is what my character would do, that's not a valid argument at the table. You have full control over the personality and what your character says and does. Yeah, and you owe it to the other players at the table to not use that as a cudgel to behave in a disruptive manner. Yes, getting into your character's personality is so important to this game. There are lots of creative ways to roleplay a character who is a jerk, who is abrasive, who is violent, but those things need to be constrained to the fiction of the game world and not present in the real relationships at the table. It's one thing to have two characters who have a rough relationship or a conflict with each other, but if that's boiling over into the relationship that you have with your friends at the table, that's a problem and it needs to stop. You also want to make sure to respect the Dungeon Master's authority. At the end of the day, they're the ones who get to dictate the rules and lay down the law of the game world that you are playing in. So you need to respect that. The Dungeon Master has the absolute authority about how the rules work in play. They have the right and the responsibility and the discretion to make changes to the rules at any time they wish. They may change the statistics on a monster. They may change the way a spell works. They might even change your class features. Of course, if they're a good dungeon master, they're going to talk to you about this before they do it. But it does mean that if you run into a monster and suddenly it has an ability that you aren't familiar with, the DM is allowed to do that. And it's really kind of cheating or metagaming on your part if you make assumptions about what, the, what other non-player characters are capable of based on your knowledge of the rules. The DM has the ability to change those things at any time. And the sooner you accept that and be respectful of that, the more, be the more positive relationship you'll have with your dungeon master. Another point that I cannot stress enough is do not get salty or upset if things don't go your way. As a matter of fact, when things don't go your way and you have a bad dice roll or an outcome is not what you were expecting, the best thing you can do is role play with it because I have seen so many times that a failure in the game has become one of the most memorable moments and has actually turned into laughter and cheers from the entire group mm -hmm. around the table. If you are getting upset by something that's happening in the game, if you're having a string of bad die rolls, if your massive cinematic attack maneuver failed, if you got killed and you're feeling upset about it, it's okay to tell everyone else at the table, hey, everyone, I'm feeling bad about this. And then you can talk about it. If you feel the need to stop the action at the table so that you can communicate your feelings because you're not feeling okay the way things are going on, that is the best way to move forward. Rather than getting salty, angry, or upset about how things are going, talk about it in the moment if you need to. And it's sometimes advisable within your groups, particularly if these things are occurring often in your group, have some sort of policy in your group that allows someone to say, hey, we need to stop before this continues because this is going down a road that's going to make me feel upset or frustrated or worse. So principle number two is be focused. This means that you're showing up to the game mentally ready to take part. Exactly. 
you might have other things going on in, in, in life that might be distracting, like maybe your phone is blowing up with a bunch of text messages, or you're trying to follow the latest score on a sporting event, or maybe you're kind of upset because you're missing the latest episode of Game of Thrones. You need to put those distractions aside when you get to the game table. Everyone's coming together to play Dungeons and Dragons. There's so many different ways that you can hang out together, but D&D is special. And it's important to focus on the fact that we're playing D&D together. That focus uh, isn't just on yourself, but also you want to be focused on everybody's enjoyment of the game. When it's somebody else's turn, don't start chatting with the players next to you. Focus on what the person who's taking their turn is doing. And that's a great opportunity to add to that or engage with it. Now, there are going to be tons of times in D&D where something happens that reminds you of a joke or an anecdote or a story or something you read on the internet. And you're going to want to tell that story in the moment. That's okay. But know when you need to reel it in and focus back on the action. And don't get upset if the dungeon master says, hey, that's a really funny story, but just reel this in for now. Let's focus on the game. Yeah, I find that at our table, this, this does happen quite a bit. We're all really close friends, and we like to chat. And occasionally, if there's a pause in the game, or Monty's setting up a new scenario, we'll start chatting. But the moment that Monty says, hey guys, let's rein it in, we're getting, we're getting back into the game, that's our cue to stop the chatter and focus back in on the game. And we take that cue very, very much to heart. Now, I will say, it's completely natural to do things while you're waiting for your turn to come up, like making dice pyramids, or doodling a small sketch, or maybe even checking your phone. But don't make a habit and don't let those things be more engrossing to you than what's happening at the table around you. There are a few things more frustrating for me as a dungeon master than when it comes around time to a player's turn and they don't know what was happening because they were on their phone checking Facebook instead of paying attention to the action of the table. And now they spend three times as much time taking their turn because they need to remind them of the state of the game, remind them about um, what the previous happened on the previous turns and now they need to spend all this time thinking about what they're going to do on their turn. Dungeon Masters put a lot of work into preparing their game. They might spend hours coming up with concepts and ideas to run that night's session. Um, so if you want to respect that, going back to our first point, focusing is respectful to the DM. Continuing on with the amount of time a Dungeon Master puts into a game brings us to our third principle, which is be reliable. When you make a commitment to a Dungeons & Dragons group, it is vitally important that you and the other players set very clear expectations about how often you're going to play, when you're going to play, when you're going to stop, and where you're going to play. And make sure that you uphold that by showing up on time for the game. Obviously, there's reasons that you might not be able to make it to the game. But if that reason is, I really wanted to watch Game of Thrones and I didn't let anybody know that I wasn't going to show up, that's not great. If you let people know ahead of time about a family emergency or an event that you have to go to, uh, that's fine. That's going to let everybody know, hey, I'm out for this week. But it's not good taste to say an hour before the game, hey guys, I'm not going to make it because I got this thing. Sorry, I forgot to tell you about it. The reality of it is, is that most Dungeon Masters have a huge list of other people that they would love to get involved in their games. And when you cancel last minute like this, it really signals a lack of respect for your Dungeon Master's time, as well as the time of all the other players at the table. At least 24 hours notice if something's come up is more than fair. But if you don't tell anybody that you're not going to be there, or worse, you don't show up at all and leave no messages, that's really, really rude, and your friends are owed a little bit more respect than that. The next point is be prepared. And that means showing up to the game with your character sheet ready, your dice ready, and you know what you're capable of and what you're going to be doing that night. You know about your character. Yeah, this means that you come to the table with your character sheet, your dice, a pen and a pencil, all the other things that you need to play. If you play with miniatures, you've brought your own mini. If 
that's the way your, your group works. And also that you are prepared to engage with the mechanics and the game rules and the role playing that are associated with your character. This can be the hardest thing for a new player to get used to because there are certain elements of your character sheet that you may want to memorize before coming to those games. You may want to memorize things like your AC, what your weapon attack modifier is, any spell modifiers that you might have, uh, some of your main saving throws or ability scores. And I also recommend keeping notes about the most important NPCs, places, or items in your campaign. You don't necessarily need to memorize these things at first, and probably as a new player, this can be a very hard thing to do. At the very least, I recommend, if you're new to the game, highlight these things on your character sheet or keep a separate note card so they're all in one place. Things like your AC and your attack bonus and your top skills come up time and time again. Um, and for new players, I find that they spend a lot of time searching around your character sheet. And the character sheet is organized, but it isn't always intuitive where that information is for new people. So highlight those things, put them on a separate note card. And at the same time as well, um, if you're the type of person that you're getting new to the game and you're picking up a D12 instead of picking up a D20, a really awesome tip for this is to use different colored dice for the different die sizes until you get used to what they are. These are things that seem kind of minor, but they can really speed up the game and have a huge impact. A lot of people associate color more so than different shapes. So being able to differentiate your dice by color can actually be really, really helpful for new players. For anybody who has a character who's leveling up and you want to come prepared, maybe a spellcaster, you want to read your spells that you're choosing. Picking a spell based on its name and reading it once and then showing up a week later and being like, I cast this spell. In the middle of combat, trying to learn what that spell does is not always the best time. It's going to really slow down the game for everybody while you try to figure out exactly how that spell works. I cannot tell you how many times I have seen a player that wants to cast a spell like Charm Person or Phantasmal Force or Dominate Person or an Illusion Spell and they haven't taken the time to learn how these spells work and they have a creative idea in their mind but don't realize, oh, you can't make an illusion that large. It isn't physically present or that a Charm Person spell isn't mind control uh, and they get disappointed when it doesn't work the way they thought they do. Take the time, if you're playing a spellcaster, to read out your spells. Read them out out loud if it helps. Reading them out loud can actually really impact this because the spell usually says exactly, well, it always says exactly what it does. And sometimes when you're kind of breezing past it, you might miss a few things, but reading it out loud allows you to take the time to actually gather all that information and say, oh, that mm -hmm. makes sense. And this all follows through to, if you want to be prepared and be focused, being prepared means being prepared for your turn in combat. It means being prepared to engage with the other players as well. And it means having some sense of where the adventure is going to. Um, time and time again, if you are not reliable, if you're not focused, how can you be prepared for what's happening in the role playing of the game? How can you expect to follow through the plot or the quest that you're going on? How can that be meaningful to you and you to get the fun out of it if you're not paying attention and if you're not prepared to engage with it? Our next point is be cooperative. And this is really important because it is, at the end of the day, a cooperative game. Everybody at that table is sharing in this story together. So you need to take part in the story and you need to work with the people around the table to help explore the world that's being presented to you. Most importantly, you need to be cooperative with the dungeon master. The dungeon master is not your adversary and they're not your enemy. They're someone that is your guide to the world, the referee to the rules, and your co-creator in the story that you are all weaving together. Trusting them and cooperating with the dungeon master as well as with the other players in a positive means is going to make sure that your game experience is really, really fun. Whether or not you're having a heroic campaign or a campaign where you're a Machiavellian group of backstabbers. Even a game where everybody's out to get each other and that you are actually working against each other um, can still be a cooperative game because you all have the same expectations on what to expect at that table and you all know to work together to accomplish that. 
Yeah, so it means that you're buying into the cooperative ideas of the table and that you know when to help each other out. Part of being cooperative as well as being respectful in a big way is sharing that spotlight. You don't yeah. want to steal the spotlight from somebody else. If another player is having a moment and you have a great idea, now's not the time to be like, oh, my character is going to jump in here. Let each person have the spotlight. Once they're done presenting their moment in the spotlight, if you have something that you think is going to uh, cooperatively join in on that moment, then add it in and see how that works. Being cooperative means that you don't want to shut anybody else down at the table. If somebody has a really funny idea or they decide to go out of their way to present a joke and they're being outgoing, uh, now's the time to help boost them up. You want everybody at the table to take part in this. And I find that it works much better if you're being a cooperative team and helping let jokes or ideas or concepts really play around the whole table. Expanding this idea, we come to our next principle, which is being constructive. And this is less about being cooperative between the other people at the table, but more about being constructive on the narrative and the story that you are all creating together. This is the, one of the big creative principles that I think a lot of players miss out on at first, because the Dungeon Master isn't there to entertain you. The Dungeon Master isn't there to put a story in front of you. They're there to put a scenario in front of you that you need to grasp onto. Something that I have seen happen in several role-playing game experiences is the Dungeon Master presents a plot hook to the group of players. And one of the players says, I'm not interested in that. I want to go back to town and hang out in the tavern. To which the Dungeon Master replies, all right, make a new character. This is a perfectly reasonable response on the Dungeon Master to you not wanting to engage with the world. And this is part of why you want to be constructive. Find a reason for your character to engage with the story that's being presented and growing, rather than trying to derail it by taking it off in a different direction completely. It's still important that you bring something to the table that adds to it, rather than taking away. If all you're doing as a player is take, 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 asking the dungeon master to make everything relevant to you, that's not really respecting the two-way agreement that you have as a participant in the event. Bring things to the table, make offerings, be constructive, bite down on those plot hooks, and engage with the world, and you will have memorable experiences. Improv is a great skill to have at the D&D table, and using improv to kind of take those moments, add something to it, and also, one of the rules of improv is always say yes. So when somebody presents something at the table, when an idea is thrown out there and it's now become part of the game, as soon as it's established that that has happened in the game, the best option for you to be cooperative and collaborative is to look at that and say, how can I add to this? How can I take this and make it a moment for all of us? Yeah, it's a common thing as well. It's like if you're exploring a deadly dungeon to say, I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. So the solution is to touch it with a 20-foot pole. And finally, we have be descriptive, which is one of my favorite things to do at the table. I think being descriptive is one of the things that is going to improve your role-playing experience as a player, but is also going to improve your tactics at the table and your strategies overall. When you're being descriptive, you're not only um, kind of forcing yourself to to flex your creative muscle. You're also adding to the story. You're adding to your character's abilities. How do they do the things that they're doing? A rough habit that many Dungeons & Dragons players can get into is describing how they engage with the world in purely mechanical terms. Probably the worst offender for this is a player saying, I use perception, or I use stealth referring to the mechanical skill, indicating to the dungeon master that you'd like to make a skill check to find out more information or hide. Instead, you should do something different. You should use natural language. And natural language means that instead of using the rules, throw your idea of the rules out the window and use words to describe what it is you want to do in that moment. Rather than saying, I'm gonna make a perception check to see what I can find out about this room. You walk into the room and you say, I'm going to look around these walls to see if there's any trap doors or secrets that I might be able to find. 
It's then the DM's job to say, okay, make a perception check to see if you notice anything. The reason for this is that as a dungeon master, I often grant players automatic success if they describe their actions very, very well in a way that convincingly to me, there's no chance that they can fail. Um, and so I love it when players are engaging with the world and doing this because I can say, yeah, you describe the way that you examine that wall and there is a secret there. And there's no way anyone that looked at that wall would not be able to find that, especially because you said you were gonna get down on your hands and knees and look at, with a little magnifying glass for the next two hours. That's fine. This is engaging the core mechanic of Dungeons and Dragons. And surprisingly, the core mechanic of D&D isn't rolling dice. The core mechanic of Dungeons and Dragons is the dungeon master describes the environment. The players describe their action. Then the dice are rolled. Notice that is very important. The word description is used twice in explaining how our game works. It's so important to augmenting how you role play but as we saw in these examples, it also enforces the strategies that you can use. Of course, you don't always have to be descriptive in every combat encounter, but we try really hard to make sure that every weapon attack, every spell cast, is accompanied by a suitably cinematic and appropriate description. It also, that helps engage the other people at the table. When we talked earlier about, you know, focusing in on other people's turns, paying attention to what's happening at the table, I'm playing a monk, I punch and kick, but I like to describe the way in which I'm punching and kicking, my flipping through the air, all of my dodges, and when something doesn't pass my AC, I describe me leaping into the air and doing like a flip or something to dodge out of the way. I find that that makes it much more engaging and other people can picture it better in their heads, which makes a cinematic moment that they'll remember. And as the dungeon master, if you do need to ask for a roll for whatever the players want to do. Let them describe the first half of the action, and then you get to build on top of that, again, being constructive by narrating the results of those players' actions, whether or not they succeed or fail. And when we're all building on top of each other, this description is going to power all of the other principles because a great description is going to mean that it's so much easier for everyone to stay focused, collaborative. It's so clear to cooperate. And I find as well that being description about your actions really even helps with like managing the rules of the game because you're using this natural language to communicate your intent as a player. If you communicate your intent from the very beginning and say, I want to um, roll this boulder down the hill and bowl the orc army over like bowling pins, rather than say, step, break that down step by step, Tell the DM that's what you want to do, and now we can work it out with the mechanics of the game. So this has been our top seven principles to being a great D&D player. We hope that you feel inspired to bring the best you to the table. We have found that these principles have guided us to play some great and memorable games of Dungeons & Dragons, and we hope they do for you as well. Now, of course, this is by no means an exhaustive list for any D&D players, new or old. And we would love to hear your top tips for Dungeons & Dragons players in the comments below. And if you wanted to jump to the other end of the screen, we have our top 10 principles for DMs right up over here. And of course, we have a complete list of class guides for all 12 core classes in D&D 5e right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.